Hey, hi everybody. Thanks so much for coming today. Uh, this is uh, the amphibian and egg mass identification webinar uh, in the Lunch in the Wetlands webinar series. We're really excited that we can offer this uh, to the public this year. Uh, and it's been really great seeing all the engagement that the series has been getting. Uh, so first and foremost, um, as the BC Wildlife Federation is a provincial organization, uh, we work and live across what is known as British Columbia, and we acknowledge and respect the uh, 203 First Nations who have lived in relationship with lands since time immemorial and continue to do so today. Um, at the BC Wildlife Federation, we acknowledge that reconciliation takes time and we are prioritizing building relationships with First Nations communities and the BCWF supports Indigenous-led conservation by partnering with First Nations on habitat restoration, education and training, and knowledge sharing opportunities. And we are really excited to support and work alongside many nations and bands. And we're really grateful to have the guidance from elders, knowledge keepers, uh, and community members uh, throughout the work that we do. Um, and today, I'm calling in from the unceded and traditional territories of the Quaquitlam First Nations. Um, and if you know whose traditional territories you're currently on, um, I'd like to invite you to write it in, into the chat box, uh, as I know that we have a lot of people joining us today from many different places. Um, and if you don't know whose lands you're on, uh, I encourage you to make yourself familiar uh, with the Indigenous peoples whose land you occupy. Uh, so, Feel free now to just share that in the chat if you're able to, that would be really great. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, um, Wildlife Habitat uh, Canada for being able to make webinars like this free and open to the public. Uh, we're really grateful to have their support so we can offer programming like this uh, to the public. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of the BC Wildlife Federation, uh, in case you're not too familiar with the work that we do. Uh, so this program is offered through the BCWF's Wetland Education Program. Uh, and the Wetland Education Program team works to restore, enhance, and conserve wetlands across British Columbia. Uh, they offer uh, a number of different workshops, some virtual and some in person. Uh, we have some listed there, the Wetlands Institute, Map Our Marshes, Wetland Keepers, um, and then the Wetland Workforce uh, works in work pods across the province of British Columbia to continue to do uh, wetland monitoring and maintenance work. Um, the BC Wildlife Federation also has a number of different programs. Uh, we have our Fish Habitat Restoration and Education Program that does uh, educational workshops and riparian planting and maintenance workshops. Um, we also have our uh, in-person, or sorry, our people in the office uh, that do our membership and handle our core certificates, which is needed if you wanted to become a hunter in British Columbia. And we have our youth programs that offer summer camps throughout the summer and then educational programming during the rest of the year. So if you'd like to learn more about the BCWF, uh, please feel free to check out our website. It's bcwf.bc.ca. Uh, so for the webinar today, um, we are gonna have some time at the end for questions. So throughout the webinar, uh, if you have a question, feel free to enter it into the chat. Um, and then if Kendall sees it, uh, they're welcome to answer it right away, or we will all wait uh, until the end of the webinar to have a discussion and answer some questions. Um, so please keep yourself muted as well to avoid background noise. Um, and there's some instructions on the bottom there with the icons and then also how to pop out your messages uh, if it's too distracting in the chat. Great, uh, and today we have Kendall who is gonna be presenting amphibians and egg mass identification. Uh, so Kendall, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Just getting all the things set up. Okay. You can see my screen, everything's great. Does it work? 
Great. <laughs> okay, cool. Just making sure. <laughs> and da da da. Making sure all the other things. Okay, there we go. I think I'm set. All right. Thank you. Thank you for all those that decided to come <laughs> today. I'm very excited. Amphibians are my absolute favorite thing in the world. I'm very passionate about it. Um, every spring season, I'm always very keen to go out in the field. Best season of all, but I'm very biased. Um, <laughs> first, I'm going to share a few resources. First, I'll do my email in the chat. Um, oh gosh, everything changed. Where's the chat? <laughs> oh, right there. Okay. Sorry, my screen just shifted all my things. Okay. Okay, there's my email. And then also I'm going to share two awesome resources that I use all the time. There we go. Okay. So the first one is a website that has everything you ever wanted about amphibians in BC and then a field book, which I do have in person. Um, this is the the Lone Pine Amphibians of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. So it does contain some species that are not in BC, but this one is the one that I use all the time. It's nice and thin, so you can bring out a new rack pack and it has all the information you need. Um, and also for that website that I linked, also they have great pamphlets and printouts so you can print out and carry into the field with you. So those are my favorite resources for amphibian identification. Um, and myself, so I use the she pronouns. I started with BC Wildlife Federation in October, 2020. I am now a senior field technician for the Southwest pod. So I work in regions of the Thompson, Nicola, Okanagan, all the way to Vancouver Island and everything in between. So I have to know kind of a few different areas of what where amphibians reside. Um, I've been doing amphibian surveys since 2018. So I volunteered with Stanley Park Ecology Society doing amphibian cover board surveys. And that's what kind of sparked my love for amphibians. And I did a little bit of it in school too. Um, I have an undergraduate uh, degree in natural resources conservation from UBC Faculty of Forestry. So I did a little bit of amphibian stuff during that time. And now with my work with BC Wildlife Federation, I do lots of amphibian monitoring, trapping, and salvage. Um, and I do lots of egg mass surveys, and I'm doing that as well for fun for the local conservancy here on where I live on Galliano. So I'll be doing that as well. Salamanders are my favorite animal of all time. Don't ask me which specific one. I love them all equally. <laughs> They're all great. Um, so this presentation is going to be reviewing the identification of BC amphibians and their eggs. I will not be reviewing how to monitor, handle them, or their life cycles because it's just way too much information. But I do want to note that in British Columbia, you do require a wildlife handling permit if you want to handle trap or salvage amphibians. So you can't just go in and grab them. You need a permit for that. So for this identification purposes, it's more like if you see them, and but you're not going to touch them. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll be touching on range maps, the physical characteristics and sounds of amphibians. And then, yeah, we can, if I miss your question, we can always jump to it at the end. But there's a lot of things I need to review, but I'll try my best. So here's kind of the breakdown of how this is going to go. So I have some important notes that I'll review first before we jump into identification. We have salamanders, the aquatic ones, terrestrial salamanders, frogs and toads, and then the non-native species. We probably will not have time to do flashcards, but this is maybe helpful if we are able to do that at the end. So there are 22 amphibian species in British Columbia. There is nine salamander and newts, 11 native frogs, and two non-native frogs. Okay, so important things to know. Colors, they vary is not a re reliable way to ID. Um, so like, for example, the Pacific tree frog, they can be green to gray to brown, and it's not really helpful to identify by the color. So we're going to be looking at other characteristics. But the key to identification is knowing the range maps. So there's a lot of species that 
look very similar to each other, but the best thing is that they do not overlap in habitat. So knowing where you are and what potential species you can find in that region will get you far. Um, so egg masses, they are mostly laid in water attached to vegetation or sticks within 15 centimeter depth. So they usually are not deeper than that because they need a certain temperature to lay their eggs. Um, and that's for the amphibians that breed in water. And then larvae and tadpoles are difficult to identify in the field. So I'm not going to be touching on that because I don't really know how to do that very well myself. I mostly deal with adults anyways and the eggs. So um, I do want to note that how to figure out if a tadpole is a frog or a salamander is by the presence of gills or, and which set of legs are, are growing first. So salamanders will have gills, frogs will not have gills. Salamanders, they will grow their first two front legs first, and then for frogs, they grow their front, or sorry, their back legs first. So that's just like an easy way to figure out if, if the tadpoles you're looking at are an amphibian, or sorry, a salamander or a frog. <laughs> okay, and for the adults, so important features to look out that may be present or absent. So first we'll go into the frog, so the tympanum. So this is the eardrum. So a lot of frog species will either have them, the right behind the eye, or it will not be there. There's the dorsal lateral folds. So it's just like a little raised bump on the back. Uh, some frogs will have it, some frogs won't. And then for the salamanders, there's the paratoid gland. So that's like a little gland that secretes toxins. So it may be present or it may be absent, and they're usually behind the eyeball. And the coastal grooves, and that's just little folds around the ribs, and that is just a thing that helps them retain water and keep them wet. Um, so some species will have them, some of them will not. So egg masses and single eggs. So when I start going into the egg portion, I will be saying, oh, it will lay single eggs or it'll be an egg mass. So here's kind of what the difference is. So a single egg, it will have the jelly layer, the vitellin membrane, and then the embryo, where the egg mass will be a giant jelly layer, and then they'll have the vitellin membrane and the embryo. So that's mostly the difference. It'll just be all the embryos are encased in the jelly, whereas the single eggs will all have the jelly around each individual embryo. Okay, now let's go into the aquatic salamanders. What do I mean by aquatic salamanders? So that's salamanders that breed in water and their larvae will metamorphosize to the terrestrial form. So there are other salamanders that don't do this. So that's why I split them up. And here's the species listed that we will see that are aquatic. I want to note that a lot of species, amphibians in general, will have a conservation status. Um, this is because a lot of our frogs and aquatic salamanders have to breed in wetlands. They are very reliant on them. And in BC, we have lost around 80% of our wetlands in the whole province. If you look at the world, it's also a large number as well, like 80%. Their habitats are being lost due to land use changes like urbanization, roads, agriculture, industry, water diversion, like culverts, dikes, dams, and climate change. So humans love to manipulate the flow of water and this constantly affects our watersheds and habitats for amphibians. So as we go through the slides, you will notice a lot of them will be some sort of endangered or threatened species. Okay, first we have the Northwestern Salamander. So their region is along the coastal region here. Their distinct features is the coastal grooves and they have a large paratoid gland behind the eyeball. They are usually really dark colored and they are quite large. I have seen them up to like the size of my hand, I would say. Um, they were quite big. And their eggs, so they they lay their eggs in a thick jelly ball, but they're all individual eggs inside. 
and each embryo will have the halo. So that's the vitiline membrane. You can kind of see it, but it's kind of, it's hard to see over the computer, but in person you, you would be able to see it. It's the size of a grapefruit, so it's quite large and they're usually attached to sticks because sticks are more sturdy than emergent vegetation. So you'll see them on sticks and they could turn green as they get older because algae love to grow in the jelly layer. It doesn't hurt them. It's just a just a thing that happens. <laughs> and individual eggs. So the embryo will be tan above and cream pale gold below. Okay, long-toed salamanders. They are in the majority of the province, as you see here, except for the super northern east region. So they have a jagged, patchy yellow stripe or a bright stripe. Um, there's an, a few other species that look very similar to this, but the key thing is that it's jagged, which means that it's broken up apart. It's not like a consistent painted stripe on the back. It will have some patchy areas. And their tail is vertically pinched. And they have a single long toe on each hand. So like here you can see that long toe. There's a long toe there. And that's why they have their name, long-toed salamander. And they are quite small as well. They're, um, if you see them, they, they are like the size of your index finger. <laughs> So eggs are laid as single eggs or as a cluster. So here's an example of what single eggs looks like versus as single eggs laid as a cluster. So it's not an egg mass, it's single eggs, but like just attached very closely together as a bunch like here. Their jelly layer is thicker than the egg and is very dense. Egg masses are about plum sized when laid in a cluster. So quite small. They are attached to usually emergent vegetation. And the egg and jelly is more than 10 millimeters in diameter. And then the individual eggs are black, brown above, and white cream below. So you kind of see that here in this example. The Western tiger salamander. So you can only find these salamanders in the Okanagan and they are very blotchy. So they can range from being really bright yellow to kind of this brown green color. So the key thing is just to notice how blotchy looking they are. Their eggs are single eggs and they are encased with a thin layer of jelly. So this is mostly, so when I say when it's thin layer, so mostly this will be easier if you have multiple different types of eggs around. It's kind of harder if it's just a single egg in an area without having anything to compare, but I'm still gonna <laughs> review that just in case it's helpful. Um, the egg and jelly is less than 10 millimeters in diameter and the eggs are brown gray above and cream below. So here, this is already like the, embryo is forming, so you don't really see those colors as I, as I listed here. But here's another example of the blotchy, how it could look in comparison to what the previous photo was. So they could range in how they appear. The coastal giant salamander. So they are only in the mountain streams in the Fraser Valley, and they have mottled skin. So Kind of similar to the last species we've had, but the key thing is that they're only in the Fraser Valley in the mountains. So their eggs are laid singly or as a clump. They are found inside logs or under rocks along stream edges. So they only breed in slow moving streams. So they don't breed in wetlands, um, like slow moving wetlands. They're more in a stream type. So they lay their eggs inside logs and rocks that are along the stream. Their eggs are white. And when you see the eggs, there's usually a female there guarding the eggs. So not every species does this. So this is very particular to certain species. So for this particular one, they guard their eggs. 
Okay, the rough skin newt. Okay, so this is our only newt in BC. So all newts are salamanders, but not all salamanders are newts. It's kind of the same thing as toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So <laughs> they're still considered salamanders, but they are the only newt in British Columbia. They have very bumpy skin. They have an orange underbelly. This is because that's how they de defend themselves from being preyed on. So they lift their neck up and they show the orange and they say to their predator, hey, I'm toxic, don't eat me. So that is why. So don't go licking salamanders, especially the rough skin newt. They are very toxic. Uh, and they are only found along the coast region. So their eggs are extremely tiny and hard to find. The herpetologist that I've worked with said they only found one in their entire 40 year career. So you will most likely not be able to find these in the field unless if you're a super expert. But even then it's very tough because they are wrapped in the vegetation and they're super tiny and it's only one single egg. So you won't be able to find their eggs, but usually you'll be able to find the adults. They're quite easy to find. They like swimming in the water, so you'll be able to find the adult. Um, and each egg is encased, encased with a thin layer of jelly. So you can kind of see that here. You see the jelly is pretty thin and there's the middle line layer with the, the embryo. The eggs are tan above and cream below. So you can kind of, kind of see that here while it's forming. It's lighter here, darker on the top. Okay, now to the fully terrestrial salamanders. So these are salamanders that breed in forested areas that are very moist and they just birth right into a salamander. They don't go through a larval stage like the previous ones do. So. These are ones that just hatch from an egg and just becomes an, a salamander. And here are the species that we have. We have four. Okay, so the wandering salamander. These are only found on Vancouver Island. They are translucent gray or tan. They are irregularly shaped metallic flecks and have a pale underside. Their eggs, so they're single little eggs supported by a jelly strand, which is very cool. I've never seen these before, um, but you can kind of see the strand there. The eggs are attached to a roof or of a cavity. So usually a rotting log, that's where salamanders love to live is old logs. So yeah, you see their strand attached. Their eggs are white and the females guard their eggs. Incentinas. So they are found along the south coast region. They are very translucent. They have no gland behind the eyes. Why do I say that? Because most people confuse incentinas with the northwestern salamanders, which if you remember had the gland and coastal groups. For this one is more of a translucent uh, vibe to it. Like it's not as dark colored, no gland. The coastal groups, Technically, this is not like distinctive coastal grooves, but they could appear as coastal grooves. Um, for me, how I identify the Incentinas, I look at their eyelids and they usually look very sad all the time. That's how I distinguish them. <laughs> but they're very cute. Um, their eggs, their single eggs laid as a clump. So here, bound under woody debris. Their eggs are whitish and the female guards their eggs. So it kind of very similar to slug eggs is how I look at them. But yeah, you can kind of see here, it, the face looks very sad. The Western red-backed salamander. So you find these along the south coast. So see, this one is very similar to the long-toed salamander where people can confuse them. So here you see it's a very consistent color all the way to the tail. So it's not jagged or broken up like the long-toed salamander. So they're, they could range from color from yellow to red. So usually you just look for the consistent stripe on the back from the snout to the tail. And then their body and tail are flat as opposed to the long-toed salamander that had a pinched 
a vertical tail. So their eggs, they're single eggs laid as a clump found under woody debris and the female guards the eggs, just like this picture here. Okay, the Cour de Laine salamander, they are only in the south central Kootenays. They have a large paratoid gland behind the eyes. You can kind of see that right there, this little raised section. And they have a dorsal stripe, very similar to the long-tailed salamander and the western redback salamander. But the key thing is to remember that they live only in the Kootenays and with the paratoid gland behind the eyeballs. So they lay single eggs as a clump and attached by a single strand of jelly. So the single strand, I believe, it's, I think it's hidden behind the shadows, but it's by a single strand and then they all kind of clump out like grapes. Their eggs are attached to roof cavity of a log or a rock and then the females also guard these eggs. Okay, frogs and toads. Wow, we breeze through the salamanders. Is there any questions about salamanders? Well, before we move on to the next set of salamanders, or sorry, next set of amphibians. <laughs> okay, doesn't seem like it. If you're still typing, just enter it. I'll see it. <laughs> okay, frogs and toads. Okay, we have a lot of frogs and toads in BC. Um, yeah, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And a lot of them have a under a Sarah listing and has a BC status that is not yellow. <laughs> Okay, Western toad. Okay, so the majority of BC, excluding the northeast corner, kind of similar to the long-toed salamanders range, they have a pale stripe down their back. They're very warty and bumpy. They have a large paratoid gland behind their eyes. And then I'm going to play their sound. And to me, it sounds like a chirping sound and I'll play it. Okay, and why do they make this sound? So this is not a mating sound. This is actually a sound of when another male grabs onto a male and they say, hey, you can't breed with me. So that's kind of the sound that they make. Um, very silly, I know. <laughs> but yeah, so only the males make this call to say, hey, don't breed with me. So their eggs are a long string of eggs. Um, they're single filed. And usually when you see them, there'll be a, a million eggs laid together. It'll be loosely intertwined. So lots of strings in the water. There's about 20,000 eggs in one string. They will always be attached to vegetation, but the, but the rest of it will be loose and kind of flowing in the wetland. And their eggs are black above and white below. But once you see the single filed eggs, that's kind of distinguishes the Western toad. No other species does that. Very cool. Okay, the Rocky Mountain tailed frog. So this frog does not make a call at all. So unfortunately, I don't have a sound for this one. But how to distinguish what they look like and way, where they are. So they're in the Kootenays. There's two little sections here in the Kootenays where they live. They have vertical pupils and they have a re reproductive organ that appears as a tail. Um, so you can take that as, as you think. <laughs> so their eggs are laid in strings underneath cobbles and boulders, kind of like here. So very sticky, just on top of this rock. Their eggs don't have any color and they breed in permanent forest streams. So this species gets affected a lot of, with industry and the rerouting of water 
So this is a very important species to be looking at when you're in the Kootenays. The coastal tailed frog. So they're very similar to the last species we just looked at. The only difference is that they're on the coast. They also breed in the streams as well. Vertical eye pupils. They also have a reproductive organ that looks like a tail and they also do not make a call. Even their eggs look very similar. So they have very similar genetics. They're only separated because of the mountains. So that is why they look very similar. Their eggs are laid in strings underneath cobbles and boulders. Eggs don't have color. Breed in permanent forest streams. And the females guard the eggs for the species, which is very cool. And here you can kind of see this, the, the reproductive organ looking like a tail. <laughs> the northern leopard frog. Okay, so they're only in the Kootenays, a small little region here. So they have a black mask. So when I say mask, that usually means like around the snout, around the eye. So here you see that black little marking here. So that's the black mask. Has a white lip from the snout to the shoulder. So that's right here. This is the lip and a distinct dorsolateral fold to the hip. So here's the, the dorsolateral fold and going from the top of the back all the way to the hip. And their call sounds, well, to me, it sounds like a motor engine followed by some chuckles and I'll play it for you. I'll play it one more time so you can <laughs> imagine an engine sound and some laughing. Yeah, very cool. So their eggs are laid as a clump. You see here, huge clump. It is grapefruit sized and each egg is enclosed with a thin layer of jelly. So that just means they're individually laid eggs, but all together as one grouping. The wood frog. So they are only in the mid to northern BC, including the Rocky Mountains. Very interesting range. So the black mask here and white lip from the snout to the shoulder. And then the dorsolateral folds also go all the way to the hip. And their calling is different. They make a quacking sound. Yeah, very similar to a duck, for sure. <laughs> so their eggs are a cluster or multiple egg masses, they're freely floating, but that's because since they lay them as a huge mass, um, or then they become easily detached from vegetation, so they could just become free floating, but they have originally been attached to vegetation. And each egg is encased with a thin layer of jelly. The eggs are black above and white below, and they are plum to orange sized. So that would be, could be this big to about this big. Okay, the boreal chorus frog. So they are in the northeast corner of British Columbia. They have, have a dark mask from the eye that goes all the way down to the groin. And their call sounds like the stroking teeth of a comb. So their eggs, so they're laid, singly laid eggs in a cluster right here, densely packed within the cluster. So you can see all the little embryos. They're very, very dense. Eggs are tan, gray, brown above and yellow, gold, cream, 
low, <laughs> smaller eggs and longer cluster than the Pacific tree frog. Yeah, so this looks very similar to the Pacific tree frog. Um, they're just, like it says, smaller and a longer cluster. And speaking of the Pacific tree frog, here we are. So these are in the Southern BC only. And they have a dark mask from the eye to the forearm. They have really distinct toe pads, so little like suction cups on their toes. And they make that classic ribbit sound. And when they are in their chorus, so when they're in their groupings of many frogs, it's quite deafening. I live near a wetland and yeah, they're very loud at night <laughs> during breeding season. <laughs> so they lay their eggs either single or in a cluster. And each egg is encased with a thin layer of jelly. Eggs are tan gray above and yellow gold cream below and they are grapefruit size. So very similar to the boral forest frog, very similar genetics, but the mountains has separated them. So, yeah, but not as dense as the last one. Northern red-legged frog. So they are in the south coast only, including Haida Gwaii, I have a patch of yellow green on the hip, so you can kind of see that right here. I have a bright red inner legs, which you can kind of see a little hint of right there. And they only call underwater. So the only way you can tell if you have red-legged frogs without just seeing them and identifying their eggs is to have a hydrophone in your pond underwater and seeing if they're calling. And this is what it sounds like when you do that. Yeah, so very subtle. I'll play it one more time. So their eggs are single eggs laid in a cluster. Their eggs are large and enclosed with a thick layer of jelly and eggs are black above, white below. The egg mass is grapefruit to cantaloupe size. That is huge. And that is very, very much true. I've seen them about to cantal cantaloupe size, so they can get pretty big. And before hatching, the eggs tend to float to the surface and spreads out and it will appear really frothy. Um, you can also notice that too, after they hatch, you can see like this aftermass of really frothy bits and that's usually a hatched egg mass. Yeah, because they come so heavy and also the jelly layer likes to absorb water so it makes them really buoyant. So that's why they tend to detach from the vegetation. Columbia spotted frogs. So they are in the majority of BC excluding the south coast and the Tyaga Plains. They have sharp spots. When I say sharp, which means they're really edged, they're not circular, um, with dark ring and a light center. So you kind of see that here. The very edged, it's a dark circle with a lighter inside. And their call sounds like a knocking sound. <laughs> Yeah, so kind of like knocking on wood. It sounds kind of distant. I'll play it one more time. So their eggs are in a cluster or multiple egg masses. They're freely floating. That's because they easily detach from vegetation. I usually find these in really shallow edged areas, um, usually with a lot of vegetation and the un underground, uh, I'm sorry, under the water. Uh, that's where I usually tend to find these egg masses. Uh, the eggs are black above and white below. They are about orange sized. And before hatching, the eggs may spread out and look frothy, very similar to 
the other species. The Oregon spotted frog. They look very, very similar to the Columbia spotted frog. The difference is that the Oregon spotted frog are only in the Georgia depression on the coast here, like the lower mainland, the Fraser Valley, that's the only areas that they're found. They also have dark ring with a lighter center for their spots. Their underside is red with gray modeling and their calls sound like a helicopter. I'll play it one more time. So their eggs are usually a cluster of multiple egg masses like this picture here. There's tons, tons of them. Freely floating because they detach from the vegetation. The eggs are black above and white below. The cluster is usually orange sized and before hatching, the eggs may spread out and look frothy. I know there's an area in the Fraser Valley where they're very abundant and the Fraser Valley Conservancy usually does lots of cool work with these frogs if you're interested. <laughs> the Great Basin Spadefoot. This is my favorite frog because they look very cute to me. <laughs> and I got to see them for the first time this past summer. Um, they have vertical pupils, scattered red bumps on the back. They have a spade-shaped knob on the heel for digging. So on their little feet, they have this little black little spade that they use for digging because they dig underground when it gets too dry. Um, or if it's winter, then they go hibernate under underground. And yes, they're only in the region of the Thompson Okanagan region. And their calls are very similar to that wooden frog toy. So if you know what I'm talking about, it's the one where you have that wooden stick and you go along this wooden frog toy and, and you go back like that. That's the one I, I was thinking of when I uh, picked a similar sound, but this is the actual call. That was very short, I'll play it again. <laughs> Okay. And their eggs, so they're laid single eggs as or as a cluster. So here you got the single eggs as a cluster, randomly shaped from grape to plum sized. So that's still pretty, pretty small. Eggs are tan gray above and cream below, and the eggs are soft and can easily detach from the cluster. Unlike the other ones where they were kind of pretty dense together, like the cluster and the egg mass was very dense, but this seems like it says very loose. Okay, and now the common non-native amphibians. Okay, so there's only two non-native species in BC. Uh, that just means they're historically not found in these areas. And just because it's non-native doesn't necessarily mean it's invasive, but in our case, they are also invasive. So invasive just means they outcompete our native species for resources. And in our case, these also eat our native species, which is not good. <laughs> um, they, these species breed in the summer where our native species only breed in the spring. So you will only find non-native amphibians in permanent water sites where our ephemeral wetlands, our native species are adapted to breed in those systems. So if you start noticing egg masses in the summer, say in July, most likely you have our invasive species in that system. So our first one is the American bullfrog. So they're found along the south coast and the Okanagan. Uh, there are a few records of them being found in the Okanagan, but are being heavily controlled right now to avoid the spread of the bullfrog. And there's also one record in Lemons Lake in the Kootenays. 
And the reason why they were brought over to our side of North America is because uh, people would eat them <laughs> for frog legs. So that's why they were brought over. They are native to the eastern part of North America. Um, so the way to distinguish them, they ha have a large tympanum behind the eye. And the this is the dorsal lateral ridge. So remember seeing it along the back. Well, this time it's kind of folding over to the tympanum. And their call, they make a deep room sound. <laughs> Yeah, very distinct. Okay, so they're eggs. So they look like a film on the surface up to one meter long. You can kind of see that here. It looks like little speckles, like poppy seeds scattered on top of slime on the surface of the wetland. They're freely floating. They are not attached to vegetation. Before hatching, the eggs will become frothy, very similar to our native species. And the eggs are black above, white below, and they only breed in permanent standing water. And our final frog for the day, this is the green frog, also invasive. They are found on the coast from Hope all the way to Vancouver Island. They have a large tympanum behind the eye. They have a lighter lip line, so you see here really light on their lip. The dorsal lateral ridge only runs halfway on their back, so it kind of starts from the tympanum and runs back and kind of stops running. And their sound is like a broken banjo, so very unpleasant sound. <laughs> Okay, so their eggs are very similar to the other invasive species. So it's egg-like egg film on the surface of the water up to one meter long, looks like poppy seeds scattered on top of slime, really floating, not attached to vegetation. Before hatching, the eggs become frothy. Eggs are black above, white below, and they only breed in permanent standing water. The difference between the bullfrog and the green frog is that this one it will be smaller than the bullfrogs. So their egg masses will be less than 30 centimeters in diameter. And the eggs are small and enclosed with a thick layer of jelly. So in BC, you are supposed to humanely euthanize the green frog and the bullfrog if you do encounter them. Um, you probably need a permit for that too. <laughs> But just so everyone's aware that we do have invasive frogs that do take up the breeding areas from our native species and will eat our native species. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information and I kind of quickly went through all of them because I had a lot of slides. But those are all the species that we have in BC. If we have any questions, please ask them now. Otherwise, we can try going through some some study flashcards that I could test you to see if people know the species that I just reviewed. <laughs> There's one question in the chat um, from uh, Lindy. She said, I've heard from others that the male Western toads in the East Kootenai do not make the chirping sound. Uh, do you know why or is this true? Hmm. I don't know about that per se. It could be maybe these frogs are able to know, like distinguish their which ones to breed with and like more properly than ours do on the side of VC, but I'm not 100% on that. I will look into that though. That's very interesting. <laughs> Ooh, okay, I see the questions. Okay, can you explain a bit more 
what you were mentioning earlier about newts being salamanders and toads being frogs and not vice versa. What are the differences? Ooh. <laughs> um, that's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that. I just know that that is what it is. But um, yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest. It could be a genetic thing, but I, I have no idea, to be honest. I'll look into it though, but great question. Do you need a permit to remove? Are these considered pests, American bullfrog or green frogs? Um, yeah, like Lindy has responded. Yeah, if you're moving a live animal, you need a, a permit. Yeah, you do need a permit to do anything with any wildlife, um, unfortunately. <laughs> But also, you, yeah, it's important to, to know what you're doing. But they are considered invasive, the American bullfrog and the green frog. They are invasive species. Um, but yeah, you do need a permit and able to do anything about it. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Oh, there we go. Do you use these amphibians as indicators of health of wetland ecosystems? Yeah, so amphibians are very sensitive to their environment because they breathe through their skin, which is why they have lots of slime, um, keep them wet. And, and, and so if there's toxins in the area, they will not survive. They're also very sensitive to temperature changes because they require a specific temperature for breeding for the larva to hatch properly. Um, also, there is, I forget which species it was, but um, there was a study done that they tested out the temperature of larva and they would become a certain gender it, depending on what temperature it was. So, <laughs> which is very interesting. So yeah, amphibians, if they're present in the ecosystem, then you will have a very healthy ecosystem because they will eat all the mosquitoes. So people often think, oh, well, if I have a wetland in my backyard, I'm gonna get more mosquitoes. Not necessarily, because if it's a healthy ecosystem, then you, and you have all these other creatures like the amphibians and, and like, dragonflies in the system, then they will eat all the, all the mosquitoes and you won't have a mosquito problem. Um, usually, <laughs> I shouldn't say that blankly for everything, but yeah, so amphibians are really important and that's why we see them as being lost first in, in our ecosystems and they're, they have all these uh, conservation statuses because they are the first thing being lost, unfortunately. <laughs> um, are there existing strategies you know of for effective removal of green frogs and American bullfrogs? Oh, yeah, it's a tough one. Um, <laughs> the only successful ones I know of, um, they had to kill everything in the wetland, unfortunately. Um, that's kind of the most effective way of doing it because if you already have one frog, like a few frogs, they will breed really rapidly. You can try to remove the adults every season, but you're not going to get them all. Um, so unfortunately, the most effective way is just killing the entire wetland system. That is the most effective way of removing them. Otherwise, then you have a very labor intensive going in every summer and, and euthanizing the adults. <laughs> hey, doesn't seem like there's any other questions. So we have five minutes left. We can quickly go through like three flashcards and see if people know what species they are for fun. <laughs> if you if you have to leave now, then thank you for joining. Um, but I'll go through three species and type it in the chat. 
to guess what species it is. Okay, here's the first one. I'll give everyone one minute to put in their guess. <laughs> you can use the resources that I sent at the beginning. Yeah, it is the rough skin newt. Good job. Okay, how about this one? Oh yeah, in the chat, Ar Arnie's said that bullfrogs and gray frogs are Schedule C, so you don't need a permit to hunt or kill them. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. I did not know that. So there you go for everyone that needs wants to deal with their invasive frogs. <laughs> you don't need a permit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so there are guesses between bullfrog and green frog, more bullfrog. It is a green frog because the dorsal lateral fold only goes halfway and then disappears. That is a big key and they have the lighter lip. So it is the green frog. Okay, one last one. How about this one? <laughs> Okay, yes, it is the Incentina. Good job. Okay, I'll stop going through flashcards. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, great. for participating in that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kendall. That was great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out today. Um, I just sent a link in the chat. Um, I just opened up 10 more spots on the wait list for the next webinar. Um, that is linked at the bottom there if you'd like to check it out. Um, and yeah, thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day.